Now, tell me what did you wish me to say? How do you wish me to develop this? I'm at your well, I'm at your service. The, you put the question. Let's start with the Berwyn School case mm -hmm. of uh, 1932. I would like you to tell me a little bit about the significance of it. I, I think it'll pick me up on it. Uh, a little about the significance of it and, and your role in it and how that was finally resolved. Well, you just happened to be asking me about one of the most important cases in my entire career. Here's how it <clears throat> happened, and I'm not going to pull any punches in naming names and naming people. In Philadelphia at that time, around 1932, um, the black population of the city at that time were approximately, because I kept very careful memory and statistics in my mind. I had to use them all the time. The black population about 1930 was approximately 200,000 people. The city of Philadelphia at that time had a total overall population of near 2 million. Oddly enough, Philadelphia really didn't vary much in total size as the total numbers. Philadelphia was a city of 2 million, more or less, 100,000 more or less. And the colored population, we call it colored at that time, the black population at that time was about 15%. So 15% of a couple of hundred thousand, well, that's just 230, uh, well, yes, 230,000 people, 230,000 blacks out of 200, out of two, uh, out of uh, roughly 180,000, yes, total 180,000 whites to, uh, I beg your pardon, um, 1,800,000 whites, and let's say 200,000 blacks. Well, there's your total population at that time, 2 million. Now, the... The percentage of uh, black teachers, I'll get into this to give you what really caused this whole thing to erupt, but the percentage of black teachers in the public school system of Philadelphia was rather high. And we enjoyed the percentage of finely trained colored teachers in our school system. Uh, Somebody got the great and grand idea, and they were white people, that uh, we ought to segregate the teaching staff, the teachers in the Philadelphia, greater Philadelphia area. Now, you have to realize uh, that we were very, we lived close together, close, I don't mean in, in bodily speaking, the colored people in Philadelphia area and in the surrounding counties, let me quickly give you the counties. Around Philadelphia, Delaware County, Montgomery County, uh, well, Chester County. Now, Chester was had a large percentage of colored. Uh, now, I'll begin at this point to say blacks and whites because they are understood to be that. Chester County, then in, 18, in 1930, was uh, the, hev the most heavily populated black counties of Philadelphia. Philadelphia County itself had a, um, a small black population, uh, pardon me, Delaware County, correct that last statement. I'll go over the counties first, the five counties surrounding Philadelphia, but you have to know that. Delaware County, fairly good percentage of blacks. Chester County, larger percentage than uh, other counties because of of uh, MEDIA media in Delaware County and the city of Chester. That's the second county. The third county was uh, Montgomery County. That's a very ritzy county. And the colored population or the black population in Montgomery County was uh, a very high, a very high order. They were well educated and lived in good homes, the majority of them. And the people, the colored people, the black people in Montgomery County worked in the homes of the wealthy whites and had a very good background, very good posture, very good bearing, and very good speech. Now, that's the third county. The fourth county was, uh, did I say Chester County? Well, the counties are this. Philadelphia County, we know about. Chester County, largely uh, 
largely hard-working industrial people, and in many respects, too, domestic servants in the homes of the white people. Montgomery County had the highest class of black population. Fourth County, uh, another county, it'll come to me in a moment. Oh, you're taking your time. Why not? Now, up to 1930, all these counties had open schools and uh, no question of segregation, no separate schools. For some unknown reason, I could tell you my thoughts on it, but I don't want to delay you. I want to get to the meat of it. Some unknown reason, in 1930, a political uh, group largely formed in Chester, Pennsylvania, which is in uh, Montgomery and Chester County mixture, Montgomery and Chester County, but largely in Chester County, which is a county that's been hostile to the Negro or black man for a long number of years, decided to build a co consolidated graded school. Uh, consolidated mean part of it in Chester County, part of it in Montgomery County, and uh, part of it in Delaware County. But anyhow, it was a consolidated school embracing several counties, and it was a $1 million new graded school. And the school was to be built uh, not in Chester, and uh, built in the area bordering uh, Montgomery County, which is the most liberal of the three counties mentioned. The exact spot at the moment fails me but it was in that county, Montgomery County. It was a beautiful county. Everybody loved that county. And they treated colored people beautifully. Well, the, color, uh, the, the uh, people were given uh, uh, posters to put in their home, in their schools, in their churches, and other places, vote for the bond issue for the new high school and new graded school in Chester County, in, uh, in uh, Montgomery County, to be located in a certain city, it'll come to me somewhere, Montgomery County, uh, somewhere out in this beautiful area, which everybody loved because it was a new school and beautiful area. So our colored people took the posters to their home, took the ballots to their home, and circulated support the new public school in this area. We call it, oh, Berwyn. B -E -R -W -Y -N. Oh, and that's the famous that's the famous famous Berwyn school case now you'll have to forgive me for the moments of lapse is that, of memory is that a county? Hmm? That, that's not a county is it no Berwyn school is in a mixture of Montgomery County and Chester County and Delaware County that's okay. the point and it's the known became known in history as the famous B E the R W Y N Berwyn school case well I had been, I'm speaking of myself now, no, I'm not, uh, I'm not, no boasting of this at all, I'll give you a facts. I had been up to that time really the only lawyer, yes, in fact, this is true, but I regret to say it, the only lawyer that had been known to be the civil rights lawyer in this area, although we had had up then in 1932, I'm speaking, a number of black lawyers highly regarded, but were the older generation. Now remember 1932, I was born at the turn of the century, 99. I was in 32, 33, 34 years of age, a very young man. And the other active black lawyers, I'll name them, they're fine, fine men. Uh, the only, uh, one of the most active of the, you want to hold this off, somebody come in. Oh, I want you to meet Mrs. Up there. Oh, all right. Here we go. We were uh, on the Berwyn. I don't want to interrupt it in any way. Oh, it, it's running again. And now, uh, so now. This is really uh, the dr dramatic part of the matter and uh, something that you have to really get the picture of it. There had been a number of civil rights cases, <coughs> cases of civil rights in this area all over with respect to <coughs> the right of black people to enter the motion picture theaters and take seats in the uh, in any section where they're desired. The right of blacks to go to the uh, legitimate theater and take seats in the balconies. Prior to that, they were excluded or told only to sit in the, uh, I said take seats in the balcony, I meant take seats on the first floor. I'm a little upset by this. 
Before that, they were ordered up into the belt. There were a number of cases of uh, denial of blacks for, or any number, for uh, service in restaurants, ordinary restaurants, H&H, &H, you know, H &H, Horn and Harnets, Horn and Harnets, and so forth and so on. So I'll not go into this in detail because that you could gather yourself to know that up to 1930, 31, 32, when this other, when the case of the Burwood School case came up, there were no privileges in which blacks were, could enjoy the privileges on the same basis as whites. So it was a, but the liberal areas in the area of Philadelphia were always supposed to be, let's say, the famous, quote, main line of Philadelphia, end quote, where the great aristocrats, the Biddles, the Trexels, the Browns, and I could name them, and the Champlos, and the Champlain, oh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, lived in that area and grew, and their growing children were always playing with the colored children, enjoying themselves so far, going to the same schools. Well, in the spring, yes, in the spring of the year, I'll give you the story of this, it's all printed, but give you the lately correct. Let me just say the spring of 1929, the school boards of Chester County, Chester, PA, uh, uh, what we call a, a tough county among the, for, for colored. The school board of Delaware County, which we never liked, and the school board of Montgomery County, which we loved because it was that beautiful area of Bryn Mawr, Villanova, and those fine named school counties. The school boards met in a joint session and, quote, we're going to build one of the greatest, finest, most modern high schools in this entire area, open to all, and it'll be, be called, well, Joint Township High School, end quote. So they took, they gave uh, packards and printed matter material to the children so that the parents would vote for this when it came up for a bond issue. The bond issue had to be a joint issue of the three counties and the three schools around here. At that time, the colored Kids in the graded school were going to a segregated graded school, but they weren't unhappy about it because, uh, well, put the period there, they weren't unhappy. There was no litigation. And the one area, they didn't like it, in Chester, always a bad area for Negro people. The city of Chester was hostile. All right. But in, in order to get this consolidated school open, all the parents had to agree to vote and because it was going to be a taxation on all the homes in this area for this great new school. Very well. They voted overwhelmingly to build this uh, new graded school and high school at an area, the exact spot, I don't know, but in this joint township, Montgomery, Chester, and a third township. Chester, Chester, Montgomery, and another. All right. Delaware. Delaware, that's right. Delaware, Delaware, Chester, and Montgomery. So it overwhelmingly passed the various little township councils. And next thing you know, during the summer, the colored people became a little worried about it, concerned about it, because they were, re oh, and they had promised that they were going to abandon this beat-up old Montgomery County Grammar School, name X, forgot, I forgot the name. They're going to abandon that. And go, all of them are going to go to this new consolidated school. Well, in the summer they began, when the school was closed and children not even thinking about it, they began to repair the old, hundred, we call it a hundred-year-old school, it was probably 50, 60-year-old school, out here in uh, Berwyn and... Uh, and they're building a brand new school within eight or ten blocks from it. And the old school, they were repairing it and put it in condition, and we wondered why. So the colored people said they banded together. And next thing you know, in my office one morning, I came in. There were 50 or 60 mothers of these school children. What did they want? They wanted to see Lawyer Alexander, the known man, Lawyer Alexander, because they learned that the school that was being abandoned uh, and new beautiful school in the process of being built, of course it wasn't built within three or four months, it was built in months and months later, maybe a year. 
they heard, and they heard from good sources, their white families, what they work for, that the new school was for whites only, and that the school they were repairing, which was 50, 60, 70 years old, were going to be for black children. So I investigated. Long story short, I found those facts to be true. So I had to file a suit. Oh, but the job of filing a suit was a problem. Why? There wasn't a Negro lawyer in all five counties. Uh, those other five counties, Delaware, Montgomery, Chester, Bucks, and Burks, there wasn't a Negro lawyer. And the only Negro lawyers in the, uh, that Negro extant that is living in any of these areas were the black lawyers of Philadelphia. And I'm sorry to say, uh, I must say this, and I say it sincerely, there were no very active black lawyers who were known to the courts and known for their ability, well, I don't want to say ability, known to tackle such cases as these as the black lawyers speaking through this microphone. And that is I, in Philadelphia, Raymond Pace Alexander, and his wife, Sadie Tanner Marcel Alexander. Call her just Sadie Alexander. The name Tanner and Marcel mean a whole lot to black history of America. But I'm not talking about that now. Sadie Alexander. So, on a certain day, I walked into my office. Now, mind you, I did not know what was going on before all that. I knew the schools were being built, but that was some 20, 30 miles from my office, from Philadelphia, and the little local papers didn't come to my attention. Some minister, oh, the name escapes me, but I'll find the name in my records. Wonderful minister, black minister, and a handsome old man called me for an appointment. Didn't know who he was on the telephone. I couldn't say handsome, but on that Monday morning, came to my office, then on in Philadelphia, uh, yes, oh, I had an office in the central section of the city. I'm sure it was uh, in the central section. And my office rooms were crowded, three or four rooms I had. I had three or four young lawyers with me, good men. I'll put the name down now so they won't escape me. But John Francis Williams, a Yale man, and a Phi Beta Kappa man, and a Yale Law Review man, was my first assistant. John Williams, now deceased, bless his soul. And another man, Maceo W. Hubbard. He's living today, and he's with a big law firm in Washington, one of the ablest men at the Washington, D.C. bar. He was a, not an honor man, but a high-ranking man in Harvard Law School. High-ranking man. Followed me by two or three years. They were in my firm. John Francis Williams was senior. Maceo W. Hubbard was next to him. And my dear wife, who just left the room, Sadie Tanner Marcel Alexander. And they, the calls came in from several ministers. I'll give you the names accurately because one or two of them are living today and they ought to know about this. Call me. Wanted to see me. The ministers came to my chambers. And the lawyers came in on Monday morning and told me the story that they had been, the, not the lawyers, the parents had come, it was in September, the day after the school opening. And they went over to the new consolidated school that they had to take votes, I mean, they had to take petitions to people, not they, the lawyers, the parents did, petitions to the people to assign to build the school and pay for it. They went over there, and the doors were slammed in their faces by the principal of the new consolidated school of the five counties surrounding their own home. Why do we, why can't we come in? Oh, the Reverend, didn't you see that school down there that you and your children have been coming? We had it all painted, all fixed up neatly. The bricks pointed, new cement floors put in. There's your school, you may go there. There's where your children will go. But we signed petitions to put this, we'll, we'll call it a million dollar school. It wasn't in those days. I think it was $750,000, which today is a three or four million dollar school. Brand new school. Didn't you see, you saw that school, but you signed. We didn't sign any people, a lot of the mothers did, but they signed for the building of this school, that new school, but that's for white children only. What? No Negro children? No Negro children allowed. That's the story. White children only. And they held meetings. The parents of these colored children held meetings. That 
every night. And you know I want you to believe this. For 30 or 40 days in succession, I had to travel out at night after dinner or before dinner or take my meals out at the, some of the poor of the homes of those poor colored people. Excuse me. Hundreds of them would come to the various churches. Yes, indeed. Bless their souls, I remember. Would come to the churches and protest and said, we'll never enter those segregated schools again. We left them under the rep, using their turn, left them under the promise that the doors of these, of this new consolidated school would be open to our children, and now you're closing the doors to our, in our face, making us go back to the old barns, the barn that we left, and our taxes are paying for the new school. We refuse to go into this old school, and I'll now tell you a proc by approximation, approximately there were 500 students affected by this, minimum. 500 Negro students, but only 25 or 30 would dare go in that the building. And the teachers, well, all colored teachers, it was a segregated school, all colored teachers, they stood with the parents, but some few of them would go to the school in order that these children 25 to 50 wouldn't be sitting there by themselves. They'd go there and really just merely entertain them, not by music or dance or anything. Comfort them is the proper word. I have both records of this. You can read it. Beautiful. Well, let me get down to the legal side. They sat there for months, and these children dwindled down from 50. It started with, maybe they started with 60 or 70. Then they dwindled down to 50, to 40, to 30, and eventually they closed the doors of this segregated school because no children would go there. The parents wouldn't let them go. It was the finest uh, exhibition of loyalty on the part of the parents toward the cause and the conditions and the principle involved. And for one solid year, one solid year, that the families out in, Bur in that area, Berwyn, we call it the Berwyn, supported this, kept their children from going to school, and this lawyer, now judge, would have to go to meetings two, three, and four times a week and take my automobile and go to the various meetings at the various places, mostly the church, mostly the some, something Baptist, oh, Methodist church, then the Baptist church, there were two. Methodist and Baptist churches. Oh, I have the records. I'll give you the printed records. Beautiful records so that you'll know the names of those pastors. Most of them except one. Most. Hmm? I said that would be most yes, I'll give you the records in the case. Pastors all except one dead. And that one, bless his soul, is the leader there still. Reverend Blank of the uh, famous Berwyn Church transferred over now to the Philadelphia Z Wesley Zion or some church. I'll give you his name. Handsome man, still living. He's got one of the largest independent, independent Methodist churches. Now, he was formerly AME. That means African Methodist Episcopal. But now he's independent Methodist church because he's such an independent man himself. Now, and one year we served those beautiful people and they stayed, kept their children out of school for one year. We went to court. We were denied the injunction in the lower court. Matter of fact, we had a hard time, to be honest with you, I'll have to put it down, we had a hell of a time to get a, a, a white lawyer to, to join a member of those, one of those three county bars to join with. In, and you know, in those days, a Philadelphia lawyer couldn't practice in any other city other than Philadelphia. The law at that time was, I could not bring, or X, a man, white man or black man, could not bring a lawsuit in, in media PA unless he had a lawyer belong to the media bar. The same thing with any other county. 
uh, Chester County. He had to belong to the Chester County Bar. Montgomery County, Norris County, he had to belong to that bar. There were no Negro lawyers in any of the counties of Pennsylvania except Philadelphia. And to the everlasting glory of a white family of lawyers, you didn't expect this. I'll give you the name later. Right. Name later. A father and two sons were members of the uh, Delaware County Bar, seated in media. It's a very short name, like R-O-Y-R-A-Y. I have the names, of course. Father and two sons. The father was the district attorney of Delaware County, the district attorney. I went out to file my suit, to bring an injunction against the school board in of Delaware County, where, uh, which was the seat of this discriminatory practice. I prepared the case of myself. I prepared the papers myself. I took them out and said, I'm a member of the Supreme Court Bar of Pennsylvania. And I took it to the prothonotary of Delaware County. He refused to receive my papers. Said, you have to get a lawyer of Delaware County. I said, there are no Negro lawyers in Delaware County. You've got to get a lawyer here. All of these Philadelphia lawyers have to have lawyers come out there. I said, there's none. And oh, the white press had all of this in the press, favorable to us, favorable to me. No lawyer in Delaware County will accept this. And that was true. So the day that was printed, in the afternoon of that day, they walked into my office. Oh, I'm sure. I have it all in history. They walked into my office, and it's a short name like Ray. Uh, an elderly, oh, elderly in a sense, a man 50 years of age, handsome man, lawyer from the Delaware County Bar who knew me, and he waited until his turn to see me. He came out to my office. I stood up. I said, well, Mr. Let's call him Ray. It isn't Ray, R-A-Y, short name. Why? Why, he said, I just read in this morning's paper. Can this be true? He had the publication. I said, it is true, every word of it. So you have to have counsel from the Delaware County Bar. You have me. I will be your lawyer in whatever the case is. You put my name to it, and I'll sign. He signed right there the papers, and the very next day, I walked into the uh, courthouse of me of Delaware County, which was in MEDI, media PA, with the papers. And from that moment on, all papers were served to his office. And... Uh, so through his office, he told, gave me authority to sign his name. I took the case to court out in media. The day was set, let's say a week from that day, and the court house was overflowing with Negro people, black people, if you'll call them that today, and the finest manners, the finest appearance, and the mothers of uh, children, children five, six years of age, were banned from school refused admission to the white school. They refused to go to the colored school at my request. They were banned, and I had the case heard before the Delaware County Court, and I must say the judge was not very pleasant. Name will be given you later. Not very pleasant. He heard the case, withheld decision. The papers gave so much publicity to the case all through Pennsylvania all through Philadelphia. They asked, ordered another hearing, and I got another hearing, and this is an interesting thing, too. I was the only counsel in the case of except this fine white lawyer, elderly gentleman, and a handsome Roy Ray has come to me. Very short name. So, to my surprise, oh, and the attorney general in the case was William A. Schneider. I loved him dearly as a Philadelphia lawyer. Schneider, S-C-H-N-A-D-E-R. William A. Schneider, brilliant, able lawyer, head of the firm of Schneider and others. The firm still exists. And one of the brilliant lawyers in the firm is, oh, Schneider, Harrison, Sigal, S-E-G-A-L, and Lewis. Sigal, I just mentioned this for history. Sigal is the only Jewish member of that firm at that time. Sigel, he knew me. He couldn't stand for the segregation policy. Couldn't stand for it. His name is Bernard G. Sigel. Later, the first 
you to become United States, a president of the American Bar Association. He lives today. Bernard Siegel, a brilliant lawyer, he got into the case. And they appointed a black lawyer who was of only mediocre ability. Bless his soul, I don't say this against him. I loved him dearly. Henry P. Cheatham, now deceased, C-H-E-A-T-H-A-M. The governor appointed him to take care of the case for Pennsylvania and also named another black lawyer. Quickly, Judge. A quick like name will come. Yes, another black lawyer to work with him, who was much more able, Judge. Yes. Became later a judge. Uh, and then they got into the case. They didn't want this to be stigmatized, stigmatized the whole state of Pennsylvania and the also the Republican Party because Schneider was a Republican and the two Negro lawyers they appointed were Republicans. I was Democrat. Made no difference to me. The, the political side, I was important issue was the issue of moral side of it. Close, m taxpayers paying, I forget, I think it was a, a million or three quarters of a million dollars out of the taxpayers' money to build a new graded school, a, con a consolidated school for all of the county all of the children and to let only white children in that school provoked in me feeling this could not be America. It couldn't be and I would fight and give my blood by the way. Never got a penny for the representation. But I did it. Represented when I didn't like another feature of this which hurt my feeling badly about another great national organization. The famous NAACP became involved in this. Yes, let it be down on record, because I've written it in my history. Let it be known on record that the NAACP, knowing of this case in Philadelphia, discrimination building of five, a uh, half million dollar, a million dollar school and keeping black children out, uh, yes, out of it, and, other, and letting only the old school go for uh, you being used for black children. They sent um, famous uh, well, no. oh, Houston, Charlie Houston was my classmate at Harvard. He learned of this and he was on my side. I handled the whole case, but they sent all the fight. Walter White was then the executive director of uh, NAACP. Sent Walter here, and Walter and I were the best of friends. Walter and I conferred, and I told Walter the story. Walter says, Raymond, you fight through this thing, or we'll provide counsel for you, or help you if you need it. But you can handle this. To my great surprise, Raymond, Walter White, and I were like bosom friends. Ah. What happened? I handled the case and was going satisfactorily. And we, of course, as I said, it lasted a whole year. One day, to my surprise, their assistant general, not counsel, assistant general secretary, Waller was then the executive assistant. Their assistant was Roy Wilkin. You know the name. Now, Roy, very fond of Waller. Roy Wilkin and I were close friends then and still today. But Roy Wilkins called me on the phone. I'm going to I'll come up to see you, came to see me, said we can make a compromise or settle it. I said the only settlement of this case is they must open that door. Open those doors to black children. There shall be no segregated schools here. I don't want to go into the offer of compromise to settle it. I said I'll never settle anything unless they open those doors to black children. We held out until that next summer, and that next summer, the school board came, sent emissaries to me. Children were out of school for the whole year. No compromise except open the doors. The school board's attorneys came to me and said, we will open the doors to all black children. There'll be no segregated school here if you agree that this can be done with harmony and withdraw your suit. I agreed to withdraw the suit only when they agreed to open the full 
all the schools in Del in Montgomery County, Delaware County, and all, and there shall be no more segregation. And they wrote out an agreement. The famous quote, Berwyn School case is hereby settled on the basis of opening the doors of this new school and all schools in the county to all children. Blacks will never be segregated, and they did. And we opened the door. It was a long fight, one long year, one full year of litigation. And that's the way it ended, open the doors of those schools. All schools in Delaware County, Montgomery County, and Chester County to all students. No segregated schools thereafter in those counties. It was a long, it was a long fight. It was an embarrassing one for certain lawyers. Well, we won't go into that. Henry Cheatham, I will give you his name, and uh, Herbert Millen was the second man. Herbert, M-I-L-L-E-N, both now deceased. And both lawyers were Republicans. I was a lawyer. I fought not for democracy. I fought for the right of those children. And they, and it's down in history, we won that case. Opened the doors of all schools in Chester, Montgomery, Delaware County to all children and no segregation from that day until the present day. There may be separate schools, but not by law. And uh, I'll close this up by this question. That is recorded, and we have briefs, and I'll give you one, not at this moment, but for your writing and your history. And that broke down segregation in the public schools of Pennsylvania, also broke down segregation in public facilities in Pennsylvania. <laughs> And beg your pardon, and I'll say to you this, no one else, no other lawyer, other than this young man, now an old man here, and his dear wife, Sadie, and my law firm, John Francis Williams, now deceased, Maceo W. Hubbard, who's now Assistant Attorney General of the United States, and he's been that for ever since 19, for the war years, ever since the war years when I had him appointed, and it was our job and our work, and it was a very tough case. You're talking this time, not I. Uh, if we could start today, I'd like to know... Is it on or not? Uh, yes, it's on. It's, it's recording. I'd like to know about uh, when you changed your registration to the Democratic yeah. Party and your motivation and uh, some of the details. Yeah, that's, on. Yes, that's a very interesting question that you asked is when I changed from the traditional black uh, adherence that's in parentheses, uh, um, adherence to the Republican Party, to the Democratic Party. Well, let me give you a little history of that. It's interesting, and, and it's a part of my life. By the way, can you stop for a second? I want to ask you a question. Oh, is it on? I appreciate you doing that. And this well, is great that you have the interest. Ah, oh, I have the interest in the whole thing, and I'd like to have, just as you've told me, and I'm saying this in, on tape now, a copy of this cassette. What I'm talking about, what we're talking about, it means so much to my life, my writing, and my future, because I didn't tell you this. This year, 1974, which will be the 51st full year of my experiences at the bar in Philadelphia, in the state, the United States, and so forth, and many areas of the world, I propose to retire, and I'm going to write for one solid year, write experiences of my life. That will be a great help to me. Now, getting back to your question, because I don't want to consume the time on matters outside of the area in which you're interested. Yes, when I finished uh, law school, or all during my college career at the University of Pennsylvania, I don't want to get it too close, and uh, in my law school career at Harvard, I was the uh, as most as 90 percent of the Negroes in uh, oh in America indeed were at that time uh, members and believers in the Republican Party. Well, we continued that even during the college career at the University of Pennsylvania during my graduate work, Columbia University here, yeah uh, no New York, and at Harvard in Massachusetts. Uh, we believed in the Republican Party, and some of my closest, uh, mature friends, great older friends, 
and great American Negroes. I wish I could take time to tell you this, but okay. William H. Lewis, one of the great Negro lawyers in history. William H. Lewis was a, the first black assistant attorney general of the United States. Oh, first black, really high-powered Republican. And, uh, well, and was a great football hero at Harvard University, Harvard College. Harvard, he was the co-captain of the Harvard football team, William H. Lewis. Black, but very fair in complexion, nice hair, big, husky, strong man. And he took a personal liking to me, although he's much older. He, uh, won't go into history, but took a personal liking to me. Uh, I met him in some area of politics, uh, coming down to speak in this area, while uh, he was a great lawyer with his offices in Boston. Now, and I enjoyed him because President Roosevelt and he, that Theodore Roosevelt, were classmates at Harvard, and Roosevelt loved him, and when Roosevelt became president, made him his a first, well, one of the top assistant attorney generals. We thought he was going to be, not we, I wasn't even young enough to know about it at that time, old enough rather to know about it, but anyhow. And he learned of me in a matter that's not necessary to go into, and when I came to Harvard, oh, he thought that was wonderful, that this young Negro youth was at Harvard, and he idolized me. Uh, I say that in the best of sense. That is, he would come over to see me. That was a very unusual thing. On a Saturday, take me to the football games. So, so, so. so I loved him. He was a Republican. So what did he do? During uh, my, no, not my career at Harvard, no. Not during my college days. After college, in, after graduating from Harvard, he would write me and urge me to come to Boston for big meetings, political meetings, and I did. And then I invited him down here. I became a big Republican, big as a little shot, but quite prominent in the Republican Party because the Republicans were the big things in those days. You know who was president at the time, don't need to go into that. Um, but by virtue of the fact that I was the only Negro graduate of Harvard Law School, of Harvard, say, law school particularly in this area that is in the philadelphia area i became prominent and uh, they idolized me too i was a great paid a great deal of respect then when i got mr lewis who was known all over america white and colored but known as a great 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 lawyer oh he's a brilliant lawyer he's graduate of harvard college and harvard law school i'm wrong college he was an amherst college graduate but in those days, before 19, I think, 12, you could um, also uh, play athletic, be on the athletic teams even though you were in the professional school. That's why I changed that. He's graduated from Amherst College. He became famous as an Amherst College undergrad, then went to the graduate school, not grad, professional school, Harvard Law School, and also played football, became captain or co-captain of the football team. Now, when I went to Harvard, that was quite a big thing to think that Bill Lewis, everybody called him Bill, Bill Lewis, I've got his photograph here somewhere, would come to Philip to Boston, not necessarily to see me, but on my invitation to speak at a political rally, Bill Lewis, everybody, Bill Lewis, white and black, would come out. Now, and you're now a suggestion uh, in a nice way, get back to the subject. You don't suggest that I did. Now, how did I get away from the Republican Party? This is it, and it was, this, and it was at this, this particular thing that I just told you about was, in, in a sense, a cause. Bill Lewis uh, had me had me named, if you please, by names escape me. I see the name for it's over though. Had me named by the Republican chairman of the national the chairman of the National Republican Committee. In the 19, I graduated in, in the 1924, yes, 24 presidential campaign. Now, you may have to correct this. I mean, check this. 1924 presidential campaign. Mind that, just graduated from Harvard Law School in 23. 24, I was only about 24 years of age, and I was born around 100, as you know. And. Uh, the Republicans were trying, not trying to, they thought they had the black vote in their pocket, no problem. But then they were trying to get the younger black Americans uh, to follow them because there were more young Negroes going to college than there were in the days Bill Lewis went. Bill Lewis was 1898 class of Harvard College. 
uh, Harvard Law School, 98 and 94, I don't recall which. I'm 1923. That's 25 years later. But they wanted to get the younger men in. So Bill Lewis, to me, a conversation over the phone. Raymond, President. Whoever it was. Coolidge, someone. Coolidge. President. I think it was Hoover. Hoover was the candidate. Yes, but President, who was in the. Who was, whoever it was who was President. I think it was Coolidge. Anyhow, the president has named me, meaning Bill Lewis, as co-chairman of the National Republican Committee. Not a Negro committee, the National Republican Committee. Or assistant to the chairman. I think it was assistant to the chairman. I told him I wouldn't take this position unless he gave me the right to name some top-ranking, top-flight, etc. Negro Americans, some of my friends, children of my friends, to high positions in the Republican Party. He gave me that right because a Roosevelt, uh, Franklin, not Theodore Roosevelt, and I were at Harvard together. I was captain of the Harvard football team. Theodore Roosevelt, Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt was, was one of my supporters, et cetera, et cetera. So he named me, I'm naming you as, name me as, hold on, I do want to co-chairman. He named me as chairman of the Young Voters Committee. And I asked him, I said, now, is that going to be a seg... No, Raymond, that's not a segregated committee. That's a committee, and I'm naming you chairman. And the name was later, so that you get this accurate, name was later changed to the First Voters Committee. First Voters, he said, what we want, to, we want to get those young Americans coming out of college now graduate schools, professional schools now, at the age of 22, 23, 24, first voters, because most of them don't vote when they're in college, first voters, and we'll name you national chairman. I got all that, all that in my uh, memoirs, not up here, but it's all stacks of it. Mm -hmm. and, and I was sent, to, I asked him to accept, I said, of course, if he suggested so forth. I came to Washington. Yes, it was the Hoover campaign. 24, Hoover. And I, my photograph was taken with Hoover, Bill Lewis, that's William H. Lewis, and with Coolidge, too, and all of those. I think there were only two Negroes in the whole photograph of the whole presentation at the White House. William H. Lewis, who was then in his, got to be, well, he was, oh, he had to be in his 50s. No, probably not that old. Oh, well, I was 20, so he's 25 years. Four, late 40, no, he's in his 50s. And... Oh, yes, Roscoe Conkling Simmons, C-O-N-K-L-I-N-G, Simmons, one of the greatest artists America ever had. Oh, a great artist. One of the great bellwethers of the Republican Party. Black, my complexion, though, black, and two or three, as I recall, two or three other Negro leaders of the country, mostly ministers, heads of, uh, oh, and one bishop, see how that name came to me, famous black bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Anyway, let's get over that. Come to Washington. And young Raymond Alexander was named co-chairman of the white man, the name will come to me, of the, then was called Young Voters Committee, but it was later called First Voters because we wanted to make it to an appeal to the young men who had never voted before to vote for the Republican Party. All right, now, so much for that. So I took a couple of months off from college in Harvard, I uh, know, uh, a couple of months off from my uh, my work in the city, practicing law then, and uh, up, up and coming, uh, working man, a working practitioner, and active, actively at the bar, so forth. Took a couple of months off at the expense of the Republican National Committee. Went all over the country, as in particularly in the areas of Negro, large concentration of Negro voters, organizing committees, black and white. But I, it was my job to get the leading Negroes in those various cities. I went from coast to coast, although I don't think at that time I went as far as California, as far as Los Angeles and San Francisco. My going to the Pacific coast, I think, was to the extent of Los Angeles. Los Angeles, and then perhaps to somewhere in Nevada, but in the southern part of the country. All right. We made a tremendous success of our committee work. Bill Lewis had me uh, with the chairman of uh, the uh, Republican Committee. He became secretary. He was secretary of commerce, 
and he later became Pope Brown. Brown, I forget the name will come to me. He became Postmaster General. Brown of Ohio. That can be checked in his first name. It'll come to me. Brown of Ohio. And he was delighted to meet me. He was a delightful person. But he seemed charmed with the fact that this young man, and I was very young then in my 24, 25, as you recall, and uh, he seemed very pleased. Brown, Brown, Brown. Mr. Brown. And when Mr. Lewis took me in, called me by the first name, he said, well, no, my last name, Mr. And he said, no, no, we're all of the same age, although Mr. Brown, Clarence Brown from Ohio. Post became later in the president's, pardon, in the president's cabinet, it was named Postmaster General of the United States. That's a great political office, as you know. And he offered me a position. Oh, Alex, you're, uh, you're, you're interested in this. So let me go with this. You're very much interested. Well, of course, we won the camp. This is 1924, sure, not eight, 24 campaign. We won it. Roosevelt was 32, wasn't he? 28 to 32. Uh, let's see, Roosevelt, 32. 32 was, was his first, 32. yes. First was 32, yes. This was 24. Mm -hmm. I, don't want to, I don't want to cut that off. I don't want to talk about it. 24 to 28. I'm absolutely certain it must have been. 24. If what I've said is incorrect, let this be recorded. It must be. I'm, I'm, I have been talking to you, as you know. Uh, watch the dates. What I've said was, I've, I graduated from Harvard Law in 23, uh, 23 of course. And uh, in 23 to 24, oh, I didn't, uh, I didn't lose any time. I started to work. I might be interested you to know I won't delay this. I worked as a red cap, old hotel red, uh, a railroad uh, sta uh, station red cap all during the summer of after I graduated from Harvard and that fall I came back took the bar examinations passed them at once entered the bar in the fall of 23 therefore 24 I was beginning my practice and I practiced and became somewhat known in those four years it was 28 it was the Hoover campaign of 28 that all of this occurred now anyhow 28 to 32 well get into this when he won the campaign, I won the uh, political fight, and Hoover was nominated. I fought like hell all that summer of 20, of 30, of 20, uh, yeah, 28, or 20, you know, 27. During the summer, the election was in, of course, the election was in 28. Well, 29th summer, I worked all that summer, worked for the, for the, Democrat, for the Republican Party, Mr. Lewis was very fond of me, but he, and when they had won, and they offered Mr. Lewis a very high position, but he was a very successful lawyer and had been the first deputy attorney general of the United States, what they offered. He wanted a cabinet post. He didn't get it. He was a little disappointed by that. Anyhow, he wanted me to be named deputy attorney general for 28 years. He wanted me to be named deputy attorney general. He felt that I had was entitled to it. He felt that I was entitled to, because of my work, my record at Harvard, and also my graduate school work, and the uh, fact that I was being recommended by none other than William H. Lewis, who was the top Negro in America in the Republican Party, and that was the top party, and in addition, he was one of the top lawyers of America. And in addition, he was offered one time the almost the attorney generalship of the United States. He said, we're going to go into that. He wanted me to have it. So he sent for me to come to Washington. This is after the election now. After the election of Hoover and before, between November of the election, you see, and January when he was sworn in. I think however, they were sworn in March at that time. They swore in in January. Now, I'll never forget this. He's in touch with me by telephone from Boston to Philadelphia frequently. Raymond, I think we have it sewed up. I think I have Mr. Hoover's promise that he will name you first deputy attorney general. He's insisted upon that, not special assistant. That's the old point. Not this, not even an assistant so-and-so. First deputy attorney general. I was tickled to death, pleased with that. Meet me in Washington. Meet me. Uh, Mr. Hoover wants to see you and so forth and so on. So Mr. Lewis comes all the way down from Boston. 
Oh, this was about the first week in December of, uh, it must be 29, you see, because, uh, oh, well, they, no, in 28, 28, 28, because the president hadn't been sworn in yet. First, come down me. And he had Clarence Brown, he comes back to quicker now, Clarence Brown, uh, well, I was to meet him, meet Mr. Laws, in Clarence Brown's office. Clarence Brown was named to be Secretary of Commerce. Secretary of Commerce? I'm wrong. Postmaster General. That was the political office. Postmaster General. Patronage job, yes. And Clarence Brown's a wonderful man. I'm one corner of that. And he seemed to like me as a son. He's a much older man. And like Mr. Lewis. Clarence Brown, Mr. Lewis, Bill Lewis were friends. They'd known each other. I'm just a boy, 24, 25 then. Anyway, Raymond, I think I have things lined up. Clarence Brown said, now, uh, Raymond, I think he called me Raymond or Alexander, don't let this concern you. We've got it worked out, and uh, probably use better language than that of all. And we're going over to Mr. Hoover's office. Went over to Mr. Hoover's office. Mr. Hoover wasn't cold, but nothing warm about him like Clarence Brown would put his arms around me. Oh, he was very, t d we'll say, suave and quiet. Shook hands and all, sat down, got right down to the business. Told me point blank. Uh, Mr. Alexander, I met with a problem. I, I thought he meant racial problem. I didn't say anything. He met with a problem. There are three men from Ohio. By the way. Yes, all right. It, and it's recording now. I just told you that it took a second to tell you this surprises me. It brings it back to my mind. Mr. Hoover in front of me and in front of Clarence Brown then named secretary, a postmaster general, and William H. Lewis, one of the great men of America. Mr. Alexander, this is Mr. Hoover speaking. Mr. Alexander, I never mentioned this to you, and I didn't meet, I didn't even mention it to my friend, Clarence, did he call, I mean Bill, Bill Lewis, call him Bill. Uh, they're very good on friends. But I, I, I met with a problem. I thought it was a racial problem. And I'm naturally, oh, you know, we're sensitive. What the hell? It couldn't be anything but a racial problem in my mind. I have, oh, hell, I think, I hope I can remember this name. I have three people who want to be members of my cabinet, and they are very prominent people who are from the state of Ohio. Now, how can I, how can I name a first deputy cabinet officer from the same state of Ohio, making it four? Or well, maybe he said there are two people. I think there were two or three. But anyhow, he was big enough to name them. I've got to name uh, my friend, and this is a Brown, too. His name will come to me, Clarence Brown. What name do I give you for Brown? I've got to name Blank Brown as my Secretary of Labor because he is president of the American Federation of Labor. I listen. Oh, yes. And I've got the name, and he gave me the name, this name will come to me, the multi-multi-millionaire. Great fellow he was, great man, too, as Secretary of the Treasury. Oh, I can find that from record. Dawes. Dawes. Clarence Dawes, no. No, thank you. I'm glad. Dawes was the following administration. He was a Republican, too. Yes, Dawes was a uh, Coolidge's man, Coolidge and Dawes. Yes, Dawes was vice president. Uh, I've got to name, uh, as Secretary of the Treasury, his face is in front of me and his name, too. It'll get to me in a moment. Uh, that's part of it. I've got to name him. Now, that's not a if, Mr. Alexander. I, I, and I know we can keep this confidential. I've this morning, or maybe an hour ago, or maybe last week, one of it, within a few days, I promised him that. Brown. Now, this is Mr. Brown talking, who was named Secretary of Commerce in front of Mr. Lewis. Uh, talking in front of Mr. Lewis. I've got two men named. Now, the appointment of a Deputy Attorney General at the request of uh, Mr. your friend, Mr. Lewis, that will, they'll charge that coming from Ohio. It was, it was a very lame excuse, I'm saying this to you. It was a very lame excuse. Uh, I can get you a, 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 an appointment. I'll be very happy to make an appointment of you as a deputy uh, attorney for some other department, like labor, 
treasury, interior. Mr. Lewis blew up. Lewis blew up. He knew the Mr. Hoover well enough, didn't call him Herb or anything of that sort, to stand up to him like a man, Mr. Vi Mr. President. That will not do at all. We've talked this over, about well, conserved time on this uh, uh, recording, to tell you that he stood up vocif vociferously, strongly. I want that appointment because you telephoned me, and in your conversation, you never intimated anything. In other words, I thought that he was he let him know in front of me that he was being, in a sense, tricked. Or at least, this is something that is an afterthought. And Bill Lewis didn't like it. And he said, Raymond, take nothing. You come with me, and until that position is open and offered to you, you decline any position whatsoever. And you and I will discuss it in the future. Well, I'll make a long story short. I, uh, I'm trying to tell you, if I hadn't had such prominent men behind me, and I was then only, as I say, in my late 20s, and I had a life ahead of me, hopefully, I did. I probably would have. Not you. You like the word compromise. I certainly. I one might have thought of. Uh, might not be an assistant attorney general or something. As I was in law and I wanted to stay there, but that ended that. So I got out of the office. Mr. Lewis and I. He left very angered. Very angry. We went over to the hotel. Mr. Lewis always stayed at the best hotels, and even though he was a Negro and well known, and those days were probably no Negro could go to the Mayflower. But he took me over to the Mayflower, had dinner, took me to the station. I got off at Philadelphia. He went on to Boston, and that's the end of that story. Well, I came back to my city, of course, and uh, I, I had to live with that. Uh, I didn't change parties right away, but that was 32. Yes, that was 32, 28 to 32. No, 28, and uh, yes, 28, well, 29. Came back to Philadelphia, 30, remained with the Republican Party, assisted them in every way I possibly could. Then you had all these old Republicans. I'm thinking of white now. These die-in-the-wool white Republicans. The Vares. The Vares. And I knew them very well because I was a hotel waiter. Worked at the Bellevue Stratford and other hotels. Nothing but a waiter, but worked in the, uh, on the best of banquets and the best... Uh, dining room there, and for some reason or other, I would just say I was fortunate, the head waiters, all white, seemed to like me, and uh, they would men give many of their white guests to me to serve, and white parties to serve. I, I knew, I, I must say, I was an experienced waiter, and uh, I met some of the very great leaders. I met, I can name them, the Vare the, themselves, the Vare brothers. William S. Vare was head of the party. I met his brother, Edwin S. Baer, state senator. Bill Baer was United States senator, congressman, con no, Senator Baer. And uh, the Baer controlled everything in the state of, I mean, they were in control in Pennsylvania. But they had their, use quotations, they had their, no, I won't use that expression, Negroes whom we considered to be, well, I'll put it down, I don't say this, in any harsh or mean sense, say we call them the handkerchief heads. You've heard that expression, yes. handkerchief heads. They were the Negroes who uh, would say, oh, yes, sir, to any white man. Oh, yes, even though the white man might say things that would be insulting to them or belittle them, they'd bow, what they call hat in hand, so far, H-A-T, hat in hand, so-and-so, Negro, nigger. And... Uh, I just wasn't of that character. So in Philadelphia, we had one very tough time to change them. Frankly, you had to wait till the death of some of those old figures. Although I loved them all, and they were very beautiful to me. I can name them the Asbury, the Lewises. Oh, I can go Asbury, the head of them, Lewises, uh, the Fawcett's, and the whole gang. Marcus. Marquez. Oh, yeah, Marcus, John Marcus, M-A-R-Q-U-E-S-S. -S. Now, he was a hard fighter and so forth. Well thought of, but John Marcus could always be taken in the back room and talked to, talked to, and I don't know what happened back there, but John and I were good friends. I guess what would happen. How about uh, Samuel Hart? Well, Sam Hart was one of the outspoken. No, Sam Hart was a Democrat. Isn't that funny? Yeah, Sam Hart was a Democrat. 
light-skinned man, knew him very well and liked him. We got along beautifully. I was a Republican in those days. I was a Republican. I changed my party in 1932 after Franklin D. Roosevelt came on the scene. And I'll be candid with you. I didn't change during the campaign when he was running. It's only after he was elected and I found what really the programs were of, for the Democratic Party and they lived up to their promises and started making these great appointments. At that time, then I became a Democrat. You after. would say then that it really did more to qualitative difference oh. than, than Very did. Very much so. Very much so. You had the young leaders then decided uh, uh, time to shift. Time to make a change. And I was one of the leaders of the young group. Although, as I said, we still had supported the Republican Party in that campaign, all the way to through the Hugh Hoover campaign. Although some of our well, our able and good young Negroes, but they're mostly gone today, had gone over to the Republican Party in the early part of the Republican, in the early part of that campaign. Some. But very, very, now, John Marcus, M-A-R-Q-U-E-S-S, -S, was one of the leading and outspoken politicians. Had a beautiful voice. Tall, handsome man himself. He's a darkness man, by the way. But he was not in any profession. He went through the arts and science, but never taught. Got into politics. And got into, uh, um, what's the other thing? Fraternalism. Became head of the Elks. And that gave him big political position, you know, and jobs. Another great Negro politician, I loved him dearly, was he probably, none of your friends, Edward W. Henry, Ed Henry. But he never changed. He stayed Republican all of his life. Ed Henry, only one fault, very strange that you mentioned his name, that was a dying wool Democrat from way back was Sam Hart. Samuel D. A. Hart, H-A-R-T. Uh, Sam Hart, and he's a uh, not a scholar, just a fine, old-fashioned, like, I skin out I say it only uh, to give you the difference in shade. Bacchus was a handsome dark brown man. Uh, oh, one of the old man men's name must never leave out of this uh, resume. Uh, I don't know. Oh, John John A John A John D John Asbury. Asbury. Asbury, but they must have talked about John Asbury. And I won't leave out Austin Norris. Austin Norris was capable. Austin Norris was a younger man, younger than I am. He's living today, and I hope, pray for his long life, longer life. He's got to be, he wouldn't tell you this, but I'm telling you because I'm 75, you know, whether you look at a little, what or what, that doesn't make any difference. Austin Norris is 86 or 7 years of age. Probably, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. He's 83 or 84 years of age. Is that right? Yes, Austin Norris. You've seen him, no doubt. Mm. You, you, Yes. Uh, he admits 80, but he's 83. Yes, Austin Norris is 80, 83 years of age. Fine fellow, good, not good health. Well, good health for his age. Uh, fine fellow. Now, Austin has made a great name, but his name, great name, not as a great scholar, not as a great lawyer in the early years. He was a good lawyer when he started, but then he, not a, no money in it, he couldn't make any money. People paying $10 for cases. And I mean work for Austin had a good idea. He went into the newspaper field, started first with a small colored paper called the Negro Journal. Negro Journal. Uh, uh, it was a weekly, and it was a good way to get his name before the public. He had himself, and it carried the issues of the day, too. It wasn't very successful. Later, it was called the Negro Journal, and it became fairly successful. But the greatest success in what was that Korea. The, the independent? Ah, that's the independent. Mm -hmm. then, he were, then he went with the Pittsburgh Courier as the Philadelphia editor of the Pittsburgh Courier, gave that up and started another newspaper from the word go with a man named Forrest Woodard. That may have come to your name. W-O-O-D-W-A-R-D, -O -O -D, Forrest Woodard. Yes. Forrest Woodard's a fine fellow. He wasn't an educated man, not at all, but he's a damn good businessman. Forrest Woodard. He started, he put the money in the business, but Norris made the paper a success. Let me ask you a question about a meeting that, uh, a presentation I believe that you were involved with Austin Norris in. I believe it may have been 1933, 
and Austin Norris and yourself and one other person were making a presentation to Edwin Cox, you know, the chairman of the oh, city yeah, committee. Ed Cox, chairman of city and committee. I believe the purpose of it was uh, you wanted to slate a black man for Congress. I think it may have been Ed Henry, specifically yes, Ed Henry. Yeah, that's right. And I wonder if you'd tell me a little bit about that meeting. Yes. Um, we tried very hard to get the, a man in Congress early. And the, uh, well, certainly in the 30s, perhaps even as early as the late 20s. Anyhow, we tried to get a man in Congress. Uh, that was our first stepping stone. We didn't even have a man in city council at that time. But skip that. You're interested in the congressional candidacy. We took a delegation to City Hall, and uh, I think the head of the delegation was, uh, at any event, the delegate. Norris was on the delegation. He might have been chairman, I don't know. Or I was, and uh, most of the young men were. But we had problems with the older men, older Negroes. Mm -hmm. Problems with the older men. The older men wanted to... Uh, uh, first, they, they weren't too enthusiastic. We had a very sad group of older men. Most of those older men, and the names of them I've mentioned, uh, even some of the fellows were able. Now, I uh, say Ed Henry was able. Mm -hmm. Able. And John Asbury was an able man. But John Asbury was, Asbury was just one of those we call uh, Hanks of Head white, uh, white man's followers, or better say Hanks of Head Negro, who did what the white man did what the white man ordered. That's all. He just followed them. We therefore couldn't get 100% a, a group that decided that would go to City Hall and say, Mr. Bear, these, we want a black man in Congress, and if you don't slate him, we'll get the black people, or Negro people, etc. The Negro people to vote against your candidate, and whether we win or not, we're going to get, we're going to start crusading for every camp at every campaign for a negro candidate to one of the highest positions on the ticket and if we don't get him we're going to go get you well we found we didn't get we wanted to get marcus who's been a hell of a good candidate because he's a fine looking a great speaker great order and a good or ed henry was equally good and we also had young men in mind. We were willing to compromise. As a matter of fact, we would have taken Norris. I say, would have taken under the, not under the theory that he wasn't able. He was able. But we put these old men up. And they're your men. They're what we call the old Hanks of Head Negroes. But they're the die in the wool Republicans. If you're not satisfied with them, we have young men. And if you don't take them, then we'll buck your party. And damn it, we did buck the party. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the first races they, the Republicans lost. They didn't lose the mayoralty, but they lost a couple of, yes, they lost a couple of Senate seats, House, uh, state Senate seats. They lost a couple of congressmen. And from that point on, we became a power in the city. So that, was, that would have been the 1934. That's in the 1934 election. election. And then they began to come to us, uh, who do you want on the ticket? Who, in a, I would say, not as nice as that, mm -hmm. but we would name ten, no, they said, give us a group of your names, and we'd give three men for this position, three men for that. They'd do the picking because, you know, if we didn't think, if, if we did the picking and they opposed it, we just couldn't win. But that's the way we started getting them in. And the first Negro congressman, hmm. oh, yes, first Negro congressman is the man in there now, Nix. But that came in a different at a different time. That came. Well, uh, speaking of that, now in 1936, after the Republicans recognized that they were very rapidly losing the black voters, yeah. what did did they attempt in 1936? Do you think to try and get some of those black votes back? What oh, did, did they the do Republicans? The campaign? Yes. Did they really? Uh, you know, they were so hard-headed about this, Sam. I'm glad you asked that question. They were so confident about it. My mm. God, it took them. Hmm. It took them to the point of defeat. We had to wait till 1940. We had to wait till 1948 before we really got anything on the line from the Democratic Party naming us to our positions, to the positions in the party to run for a candidacy that we 
couldn't you fail. Mean the Republicans? From the Republicans? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, the Republicans, that's right. Naming us to a position that we couldn't fail, that we are bound to win. And that was a lousy little magistrate's position. And mind you, I'm all that time on the Democratic side. Mm -hmm. And men of my, we call it, of my class, that is, an educated men, they were all going over to the Democratic Party. They were losing, but nevertheless, they figured that we had the black booty in our best pocket, Republicans. So they were just a little slow to yeah, yeah, that's it. They, make them in. Yes, and that they, and while a few of them are jumping out, uh, we, not, we got enough men on the, uh, on the election polls, you know, and on the election booth, we'll both put them in crookedly or what, that we can carry, uh, we can carry the black district. And those smart guys, uh, meaning like Alexander and that crowd, Norris and that crowd, those smart guys, we're going to lick them. And they think they're putting their people in. We've got those people in our best pocket. And I was one, I was the happiest man in the world in that 1948, 15, and 52 campaign. I ran in the 52 campaign. That was, 48 is the first time we carried the city. It was a poor election, city controller, but we won it, mm -hmm. test election. 50 was the next time, that's the fight between city controller and who was the next thing. Some minor office like uh, sheriff, something of that sort. Mm -hmm. But the big election was 1952, when the whole slate for city council, whole slate for magistrates, for governor, for governor and for Congress came up and the United States Senate and we won with the, the governor, won with United States Senator Hugh Clark, uh, Joe Clark, Clark, Joe Clark and the congressman and the congressman, we had the black congressman who's Nix and IX who's in there today and uh, put in a magistrate, two magistrates and councilman and I was the head of the well, I was the, cha the chairman of the whole group. I'm no boasting about that because I was there with the day. Just, just had to be in there fighting, fighting away, and took the risk, taking the risk, rather, being a lawyer at the bar every day, fighting in the courts where these men had their henchmen, where the big politicians had their named men standing in the court, and judges on the bench, appointments, and so forth and poll watchers and takers and all that. And I'm out there fighting them. And nevertheless, I won, and they did too, the rest of my friends, most of whom have passed away now. That was in 1952. Well, it's only 22 years, but we're so long getting there, because if I was 50 then, I'd be 72 years of age. And it is true, I was 52 then, so I'm 74. Well, let me ask you about your uh opinion, your assessment of uh, some of the people in, in the 30s, the, the party leaders are Guthy, uh, Senator, uh, Governor, excuse me, Guthy, Governor Earl, well, Kelly, people of that. Yes, story. well now, let me, let me, let me, let me I'm, I'd better change the tape. All right, you we're, we're running out. What was your, your, I'd like to know your uh, assessment of men like Senator Guthy, Governor Earl, uh, City Chairman Kelly. Yes. Yeah. Well, you happen to mention men that I knew very, very well, three of them intimately. I'll, I'll start with the first, though. You said Senator Guffey. There's a much older man, of course, Guffey's living today, and I think he's 94 or 5 or 6 or something like that. Oh, wait a moment. Guffey? I'll take that back. Governor, I mean, Duffy. Guffey. Guffey, I think, is deceased. Uh, someone's living today, the head of the, then head of the, uh, awfully important, head of the... Re Lawrence, or is he also no, he's Democrat. Well, let me give you the name. Let me give you about some of these men. You've named Lawrence. He is a, he's deceased, but he's a wonderful, swell man. Guffey. Now, Guffey, Joe Guffey. Joe Guffey is a multimillionaire, upstate Pennsylvania, from uh, the area of, to get the, to the minute, right on in the eastern section of Pennsylvania. Uh, I know him well. He knows me, or if he's still living, he knows me. Uh, strange about that. He's got to be in his 98th or 99th, close to the 100 years if he's living. Joe Guffey. Joe Guffey's an independent, and I think he's a self-made man. 
made money in his mining and industries in Pennsylvania, coal mining and uh, transportation, Pennsylvania railroad and development and so forth. He's a huff, very huff and rough uh, man, a courteous man, but he's a huff, rough type that you don't go in with a smile and greet you as a gentleman standing and so forth. So and he's a self-made man, too. Now, I was a youngster to him, and still, if he's living today, if he's 95, you see how big difference in age. I met him. And he was a gentleman, he's a gentleman. I was a, Demo a Republican, of course, at the time. I was a young man, and he rather felt that I, he could nurture. Nurture in a sense, I want this boy on my side. This boy's going to be something someday. That type, he would tell his friends, upstate friends, all of whom I knew, all those old upstate, well, I say old, I'm speaking of age, upstate Republicans, and they were very nice to me. And I want you to know, too, I'm speaking to you, of course. Uh, they, they were terrifically gentlemanly to me and nice and courteous. They were smart. First, I believe that they were the, that type, and let me tell you, they're different from the men today. I don't like to say this. Uh, it opens up the area of ethnicity. The ethnic background of those men were the highest sort. And I had one name. Guffy was, oh, his... Uh, when I say this, I I may have mistakenly put Guffey in the Republican camp to you, your idea. He's Democrat. He's Democrat. Yes, his sister was Emma Guffey. Emma Guffey yes. Sure. See, this is, you're, you're ringing bells that I haven't had tingle for. Sure. Got to yeah. come back. Got to come back to that. So remember when you go over this tape. You're catching, me, you're catching me right fresh. I haven't talked about this for a long time. My art job today is this writing. Oh, That's terrific. Oh, look at this. Look at this. It's terrible. Right. That's what I was planning to do before you got here in the telephone and so forth. So on. Anyhow, yeah, Emma Guffey was his sister. She is a darling. She loved me. I think she just passed away, did she not? She, I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. Oh, she lives upstate. She's up in her, got to be in her 90s. Yes, she was a lady to me, Emmy and Joe Guffey, the father. My brother died, yes. Joe was fine. Didn't call him Joe. He was a much older man. So living today, he'd be 95 to 100. He was a fine man. And he wanted to build a Democratic Party around people like me. Now, I don't, like me, you understand when I say that, because when I would bring young Negroes to his office when he was United States Senator, oh, he'd open up in Washington. In, yes, in Washington, in Washington. I would go to, we very frequently go to Washington uh, in those days. Uh, you'd know that I, he'd learn by his office, of course, that I was either coming or there. He opened the door for me. Open, anything went good for, he called me Young Alexander. Well, let's get back to this. Now, uh, let me give you the other names of the other men. Uh, I have to jump, along. I'll take them as they come to them. I knew Earl even better than I knew Senator Guffey because Earl was from Philadelphia. George H. Earl, and he seemed to be very fond of me because his, I wish I see, I didn't think of this, his closest friend was a man whom he, his closest lawyer friend, was a man he named to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, faces right in front of me, I'll think of the name shortly, Mr. Justice. It'll come to me. And that justice, seemed to like my arguments in the Supreme Court. By the way, I was one of the most active lawyers at the bar. White or black here mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia area, was all of the civil rights cases. I have to say this to you. Please remember, Alexander's not talking about himself. Never did. I haven't felt that I never had to, but the point is not my policy. But of all the civil rights cases that came to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, or the Superior Court, I better call it the Courts of Record of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. of the 50 Supreme Court Records, Superior Court Records, Court of Appeal Records. I must have argued 48 of them, which means that I was known to the appellate court. And if I was known to the appellate court, I had to be known five times greater in the lower court because one out of five or one out of ten cases gets to the upper court. It's ten in the lower court to one in the upper court. So those men knew me and liked me. And George H. Earl was a liberal Democrat. Yet he's a wealthy man. Came, his election was a big uh, surprise. He gave a lot of credit to me, and I'll tell you why. And he was right. But this is unusual. It was at that time that that famous 
motion picture theater case came up. And, uh, gosh, I wish I'd give you the name. I may, if I talk, I'm sorry, I have to talk a little to get this case. Uh, Stanley Theater case. Mm -hmm. uh, Stanley Theater. You know the famous Stanley Theater. They had a chain of theaters around here. And, whatever the name of the picture was, I don't recall, but it was a religious picture. It was a picture involving something that the Negro, the Negro uh, community. Hmm? Was it the Ten Commandments? Oh, is that a... You're darn right. I think it was the Ten I had that case. I, I, you know, you gave me the, yes. the handout. Oh, oh, by the way, that... Oh, yeah. It may have been the Ten Commandments. I had the Ten Commandments. It was a very important case. And they closed the door in the face of the colored people. When I say closed, that's putting it dramatically. They segregated the colored people in this, in this motion picture house in a religious play, which was first an insult closed segregate. Secondly, it was a double insult in a religious play. White people were up in arms about it themselves. Then the colored people came to my office. And uh, I took a bill of equity the next day to enjoin the production of that play anymore until they opened the doors, not only to the Negro people on this thing, forever and ever in every one of the theaters of Philadelphia and won the injunction. Now, how do I happen to go into that? I went into that uh, at this moment, only to say to you that that touched George H. Earl tremendously. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the atmosphere of that case. And he, George H. Earl, wonder who... I don't think he knew me personally, or I knew him personally before that. Naturally, you always accept that campaign, you know, campaign. That was the time I'm running on the Democratic, not running on it. One of the top Democrats after the Republicans had refused to name me under William H. Lewis. Mm -hmm. And the following year, uh, was supposed to send me to Congress. I haven't told you that yet, but I might as well we should tell you that. What now. year was that now? What that have been? 32, 32, 30, 34. See, 32 was the year I uh, ran for, uh, for Hoover came in, see, 32. 28, 28 yeah. to 32. Uh, 28, he came in, didn't he? Yes. No. Hoover went in on Hoover went in on 28. Went out on 30. Uh, lost in 32. Roosevelt came in in 32. Yes. FDR. That's right. FDR came in in 32, and I supported. I, mis I made a mistake in doing this. Why? Oh, mistake. I stuck with Hoover. Mm -hmm. I stuck with the Republican until he was defeated in 32. Then when 30 feet at 32 and feet at such a hell of a fashion, <laughs> only, long, only one, two, two states, I decided goodbye to the Republican Party, and it was goodbye for life. Well, then in 34, it's when they began to decide to put up Alexander for some of these congressional seats, see, uh, off-year con congressional seats. Or congressional seat every two years, so it was off-year for the Republican, but they didn't give it to me. And... Uh, it was then that the next year that the next election that um, the gubernatorial election when George H. Earl came in a big fight as whether or not he should have a black man for Congress and I wanted to be for that well they didn't go and the Democrats then that was uh, then the famous uh, Catholic God, Jack Kelly came in Jack Kelly Jack Kelly that's right Jack Kelly ran for the office of mayor damn near made it to, and I wish he had made it because I came Democrat at that time, supported him. We lost only about 20,000 votes. Democrats lost by 20,000 votes. Previously, they'd lose by 200,000 votes, but the Catholics <laughs> damn near put him over. We had a big time at that time. I think I better give this back to you. You gave me another name. Oh, well, uh, if I could substitute another one, how about Robert L. Van? Bob Van, yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, now, Bob Van's a great, great clever man. First, he's a handsome man, Negro. And I can say this to you, of course, you be careful in, in this. He's a type of Negro that, I mean, in, in appearance and color, hair, everything but skin. White. You know what I mean? White features, sharp features. Wasn't a tall man. Wasn't an imposing man. He's only about five feet. At the most, five feet. Eight or ten inches. Not imposing. They weighed more than a hundred and 60 pounds, therefore neat, fine dresser, fine speaker, 
handsome in appearance, skin perfect, straight black hair like an Indian, all straight black hair. Yes, look like an Indian, and my a little bit lighter, fairer than I am. And uh, quite a gentleman, quite a clever man. A mixture, obviously. Came somewhere in the south of the long white, beautiful woman. A little taller than he, and fair, almost white. But not. She was colored woman. So it made a beautiful couple. And therefore, a nice impression. Now, Bob Van was a very close friend of mine. He wanted me, he, he was a Republican, we call die, die, die in the wool, Republican. Mm. So Bob Van and I teamed together in 19, uh, when, when I, when I campaigned with William H. Oh yes, when I campaigned with William H. Lewis, 28, 28, that's right, 28 to 32. Campaigned with William H. Lewis when the Republicans won and uh, we thought we were going to get everything. Uh, William H. Lewis, old James, oh, the other man in, uh, the cabinet from Pennsylvania, James J. Davis, Secretary of Labor. Oh, good. sure. James J. Davis, the Secretary of Labor, Andrew Mellon, Secretary of the Treasury, and that's the, the stuff they used against me. Uh, I can't name a third man who would be as practically a, a, a cabinet post. No. you got Secretary Mellon, uh, Secretary, yeah, Mellon, and great man Mellon was, molly, 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 molly in the air. And we got labor man, Jim Davis, Jim Puddler. They call Jim the Puddler Davis. And Ray Pace, how can they all beg me? Don't leave the party and all this. Now, I'm off the subject, but I think you're enjoying knowing when I come back to the name. Anyhow, we're talking about uh, a van. And van went to bat for me. Uh, I'm saying it. And I should say, at that time, we were like that, past friends. Van became a little jealous of Raymond Alexander. He's an older man. But the party seemed to line up with me because, I don't know why, I was a younger man. Van was, oh, Van was 15 years difference in age. So if Van were living today, you see, he'd be, I'm 80, well, I'm 70, get off that, take that back. I'm 74, 75, Van would be 90 years of age. But obviously he was 15 or 20 years older than I, handsome man. He was rather jealous, too. But uh, jealous of the success of this younger Negro in eastern Pennsylvania when Van was the top man in all of Pennsylvania and owned outright the famous Pittsburgh Courier, which had a circulation at that time of 500,000 copies a week. And they said it was even more. Next to the Chicago Defender, which had made a 900,000, it was the largest black circulation newspaper in America. And later, it got to a million because they bought out papers in Chicago, Atlanta, Chicago, Atlanta, and some other place. And Pittsburgh Courier was the leading black newspaper in America until two or three years ago. Van was a prominent man. Now, tell me what, what area oh, am I well, on? I'd like to... Was, uh like to know something about Van's relationship with Philadelphia, with the Philadelphia organization. Did he have much influence here? Very great deal. Van, Van had influence with, Van had influence in every major population center of Negroes in America, in the North, and not in the South. I'll, I'll name them. He, he even had importance in New York. Of course, Van would come over there, they'd invite Van, made a handsome picture, don't you see, in a parlor. And he was a very good talk, he had a very fine voice. Come to New York, get a crowd, and his paper would circulate to get that crowd. Big, important man. Upstate, they forgot about that because they didn't go. The big cities in Philadelphia, yes, the only competitor to Van in Philadelphia was, uh, uh, the, well, was E. Washington Rhodes. I haven't talked about Rhodes. The people I may have given you all the information about Rhodes. Gene and I were the closest of friends for 30 years. We were warm friends. Different type of people, I know. But we were warm friends. He loved me and I loved him. And I helped his paper immensely. Helped it financially many, many times. Because they had rough sledding for a long while. Although, it got out. And they would no, never, I don't mean a sheriff or anything like that. Salaries they needed so far. Gene Rhodes. Now, but Van's paper sold more in Philadelphia than Gene Rhodes. And Gene Rhodes, Philadelphia Tribune's a native Philadelphia. But Pittsburgh Courier was sold in Philadelphia more than the uh, Philadelphia Tribune. It did so in Pittsburgh, of course, also in St. Louis, and fairly well in Chicago. But in the East, they captured 
they had a big power. The van was close to Farley. Oh, close to, oh, yes, oh, yes, to by the way, yes, also. Jim Farley and Bob Van of the same type. Uh, the same type of people, sporting-looking men, and Jim Farley was a great sport, but he was a teetotaler, didn't drink a bit, and didn't, uh, and he honored his family and all of that, but he liked to go to the sporting events and be sitting on the front row or next to the referee <laughs> and in, in the fighter's ring. He'd be there, ball-headed, he loved it. He loved the spotlight, so did Van. Van was a Jim Farley among the Negro people, just like it. Van and a beautiful wife, but he loved to be seen. Van loved to be seen and was at every big sporting event and every big dance and uh, loved to be seen and loved to be introduced. Now, Van and I were the best friends until something happened. And it's perfectly understandable. Van began, Van's great power began to, uh, what do you call it, began to lessen. And Van's newspaper, sad to say, began to lessen and the famous uh, Chicago. Chicago defendant, defendant. defender, mm -hmm. Chicago defender began to get ahead. Van stretched too far. He had a Philadelphia issue of the um, Courier. Mm -hmm. uh, they had his name Pittsburgh Courier, Philadelphia edition. Pittsburgh Courier, Chicago edition. Atlantic City, Atlanta, Georgia edition. Uh, New York edition stretched too far, began to have financial difficulties. Well, Van came to Philadelphia. He said, in all fairness to Van, uh, the year I don't know, but I was a young, hustling, a man represented almost all of the big Negro, uh, what, Negro businesses, there were no industries. You know, businesses like printings, newspapers, and uh, the sporting uh, clubs, uh, the bars and all, hotels, I did. So, called me on the phone, he wanted to talk to me, a matter of business. Raymond came to Philadelphia. I'm having trouble, financial trouble with my pay, a, a, at my paper. I need two hundred thousand dollars. To me, I'd like two million dollars. And I always call him Mr. Van. I don't think I ever call him Bob. Well, let's say Mr. Van. My heavens, yes. But you could. Uh, I don't expect you to have it. I didn't expect you. I'm boiling all this down. I don't expect you to take your pocket your pocketbook out and give me two one hundred thousand dollar bills or even draw a check. But I've got to have it. We are plant in Chicago and our plant in so and so. And our, we're forced, we're, we're going to face in a strike in Pittsburgh. We, we're very badly in debt. We've done this, that. Now, they had lost a lot because their paper had, you know, it's always a Republican. And now we were in the Democratic era. Well, long story short, he needed a, he needed a couple of hundred thousand, but he had to have $50,000 right away. I had no means personally of getting $50,000. I asked him who were his lawyers. Well, he had some lawyers in Pittsburgh, and the lawyers in Pittsburgh had referred to him, they were white, to lawyers whom I know, I won't mention the name, we'll call ABC firm in Philadelphia, which is a real uh, firm that I wouldn't have had any business with, wouldn't have done any business with, but he wanted, and he had talked to them, and his New York lawyer, his Pittsburgh lawyers had talked to them. Oddly enough, only way we can do business with you, we won't, we'll help you. But you'd have to get a Philadelphia lawyer, and the only one we'll do business with, and that's me. Now, mind you, I'm a friend of Bob's, but I've never had any business dealings with him. I thought it was very funny he called me for that. I went to the firm with him, and what they wanted me to do was something unspeakable. Unspeakable. I mean, from a financial point of view, and from what uh, I would say is an honorable thing to do, and I wouldn't do it. And I refused to do any have any business, refused to make any lo uh, sign any papers, refused to put my name to be used in any respect. Van stopped speaking to me. And it wasn't very long after that that his paper, I won't say folded, he had great trouble with it. He had to sell it at a loss, or he had to borrow it, practically turning everything. And uh, it wasn't long after that that he, he collapsed. Died. Oh, I guess. Nineteen forty. Was it forty? Yeah, just, 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 before, just before the election. Uh, right. What then? I don't know what it was. It wasn't at that time when I was one of those young, hustling lawyers. I couldn't do anything. I, I, you know, I, I all the money I ever made was on my own hands and ability and my mind and brain. I didn't represent any uh, industry, banks. No Negro did at that time. Not a one. I was the 
most active one, well, the leader, not that somebody else must say that, not I. But I was certainly the most active lawyer at Amar Colored in here and in many of the, considering the whole country, one of the most. But white lawyers, I mean, white businesses didn't employ us. They didn't retain us. Today, the able Negro lawyers that you may go into the office and I'll send you to an illustration. Why, yes. Oh, yes, this colored lawyer, able, fine fellows, graduates of great institutions like our school, Harvard, Yale, and so forth. People be sitting there, uh, my client, uh, who is a chairman of the board, or not chairman, one of the officers of Consolidated Edison, one of the officers of the uh, uh, famous Phil Arma, uh, Phil Arma, uh, uh, Manufacturing Company, and so forth. Not at all. All my clients were the poor colored people who were having trouble or having uh, uh, getting out of jail or something or getting struggling along with business or having and had an accident and you're making it out of an accident. Sad days. Sad days. I don't want to go with them again. I don't like to think of them, but my book will tell you the story about them. I'm going to close them. Thank you very much, George.